Good evening, viewers. Another episode of Guest with Nazir. Today, we have special subject about the buildings, design, and construction. And as usual, we have a special guest who has qualification in architecture, and he's an architect, Mr. Ahmad Chaudhry. Welcome in our show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, could you please tell us, our viewers, about your early days and your qualifications? Yeah, absolutely. Um, early days, I uh, always set out to do architecture, uh, first and foremost. Uh, but early days, I was, I've always been art-based with the work that I did at my school, through university, through college. Um, and I uh, pursued design and technology to try and experiment building models, that kind of thing. Um, so I'd, I would always be an influence through arts and design and technology in the earlier. So I knew I was always going to pursue an art-based subject in the future as a part of my career. So it means you were very good in drawings and pictures? Absolutely. We did all sorts of um, life drawing and, and uh, still life paintings and uh, with watercolours. So we did a lot of experimentation. Do you have any interest in calligraphy? Calligraphy, not particularly. I think that's an art in itself. It, it's, it's a, for me, I think it's more of a specialism, but it's not something that I've pursued in my, uh, in my past. Thank you. Uh, what is the difference between building regulation and planning permission? Yeah, um, see, planning permission is, is more design intent. It's more how the building is going to appear um, once it's been constructed. Building regulations is more how it's going to be built and constructed. So it's more focused on the construction of the, 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 uh, of the actual uh, walls, the roof structure, and it's the fabric of it. So there are two very distinctly different processes. So just to summarize, one is for how it appears, two is how it's going to be built. So what kind of applications are there where the applicant does not need any kind of building regulation and planning permissions? Okay, with planning, um, you can, there is permitted development rights, which was introduced 2008. Now, that enables certain buildings uh, to be converted, extended, and adapted under permitted development rights. Um, with domestic extensions, uh, with domestic property, sorry, you can do um, extend on the rear of the property uh, or on the side or loft conversions uh, under certain parameters uh, without the need for planning consent. Um, and same with, the, with commercial buildings, there you can have commercial change of use uh, from one building to another only in certain scenarios, uh, which enables you to um, benefit from that right. That was introduced in 2008. Now, there is a variation to that, which was introduced uh, in May 2013, um, uh, which was effectively an extension to Permitted Development 2008, um, mainly benefiting homeowners wanting to extend even deeper on semi-detached uh, houses, terraced houses, and detached dwellings. Thank you. So what are the exact sizes for the uh, extensions, especially conservatories, or extensions, especially at the back sure. of the property, where the applicant doesn't need planning permission. Absolutely. Okay, with semi-detached houses and terraced houses, you can extend up to three meters, uh, single story. Uh, now, the criteria for that is to remain within certain height restrictions, which guidelines uh, obviously state on the planning portal. It's a national, it's a government website available to all homeowners and architects and professionals. Uh, with detached houses, you can extend up to four meters, single story. Now, the extension that I mentioned to you, which is called prior notification, introduced in May 2000, uh, 2013, that enables you to double those sizes from three meters to six meters for terraced and uh, semi-detached houses, and four to eight meters for detached dwellings. Thank you very much. A lot of time people say that I have submitted application and we have some objection from neighbors. So what are the rights of neighbors, especially light affair and right of light. So how you see as a, a professional? Okay, with the rights of light is a very complex area in itself. Now, the way it benefits um, some homeowners, it, rights of light is an easement. Some properties benefit with the right to light. Uh, now, that can happen if a neighbor has benefited from unobstructed light for a minimum of 20 years, that enables them to indefinitely benefit from that easement, um, then that will stop the neighbors ever extending. Now, 
That can also happen if the property is purchased and it already benefits from that easement as well. So they can have that right to light. Now, there's various other factors like overshadowing, overbearing um, impact on the neighbours. Uh, topography of the site can also be affected um, and, and influence the decision ultimately for the planning. Um, so uh, it is a very complex area and normally we tend to bring in uh, specialist surveyors to produce all the light surveys and light levels to, to, to identify exactly where the light shadow would fall, particularly from the sun path. So the prudent approach will be that always seek independent advice before Absolutely. you proceed these type Absolutely. of applications. Absolutely. Thank you very much. A lot of our viewers uh, have interest in especially loft conversions okay. because looking at the uh, property market and I think it's easier to go for loft conversion. So what will be application, what kind of application will be required for these type of uh, work? Okay, interestingly, uh, loft conversion can also be done under permitted development um, on terrace semis and detached houses. Now, um, the, the volume limits are 40 cubic meters for semi-detached and terraced houses and additional volume of 50 cubic meters for detached houses. Now, um, that volume needs to be calculated by an architect um, to be able to ensure that we are within that volume limit. If we exceed that, then we'd have to go through the planning process, and obviously the architect will be able to explain that to you. But I've noticed that in old houses, the, especially the structure and the wood specially used, it's very, very old. Sure. So how, as an architect, you see there is any special measurements you can take about this strongness and the strength of this wood? Absolutely, yes. We, we work very closely with structural engineers to um, build the fabric of the, the, the actual loft to ensure that the, the floor members and the roof joists are all uh, adequate to actually take the loads uh, to be converted. Uh, 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 an unconverted loft is not adequate to actually re retake the loads. So a uh, structural engineer would normally come and do the calculations. Uh, we would increase the floor members. We would increase uh, the roof construction for thermal performance as well. Um, and all of that encompassed together with the structural engineer and the architect's drawings. We, that would then go through the building control process to get approval. Thank you very much. What is your view about this new legislation about the EPC? Energy performing certificate. Yeah, I mean, energy performance certificates are there purely to help reduce energy consumption in the home. Um, there's various factors that need to be considered, like the cavity wall insulation, loft insulation, um, uh, and performance of windows, heat loss, air loss, um, uh, thermal bridging. So there's various things. It, it is a very important factor, and it's there to encourage uh, homeowners and property owners to, to, to ensure their buildings are working more efficiently to help with the government targets. Thank you very much. And how you see uh, the use of old material in new construction industry? Because looking at the material in these days, the prices are very, very high. And how somebody uh, should take that approach? Because a lot of people want to save some money on the materials. See, you can recycle materials. Now, uh, certain uh, materials will obviously become uh, are <clears throat> more available and more cost effective to use on, on a construction site, but it's getting that volume. Now, uh, many in many cases you have roof tiles or you're not able to, people don't want to see a brand new roof tile when they want to tie it in with the existing property, particularly if it's in the conservation area. So you can uh, obtain uh, reclaimed roof tiles and bricks to match well with the existing property, which in, it, it, which in effect actually costs more, it costs more than uh, new materials and in certain you, cases. How you <laughs> see working on the properties which are situated in conservation area? Um, they are obviously uh, the very uh, particular features that you know you need to retain cornices uh, and that kind of thing. But those features need to be inherited through that period, and that's why the conservation in Article Four is there to protect those properties from people actually removing those and losing the character of the building and also protecting the area. Thank you very much. And when we talk about conservation area, all of a sudden we have. In imagination, think about the listed building. Sure. So, what are the listed building, and how, if somebody has a listed building, how they should approach towards any any construction, not construction, any repairs or any uh, any work on that properties. First and foremost, you need to ensure um, that the architect that you are working with has experience in 
um, listed buildings. Um, again, it is a vast area and there's vast elements of a listed building that need to be protected, conserved, repaired in a certain way, particularly when it comes to leaded glass, um, uh, 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 sash windows, this kind of thing, uh, roof materials, barns, uh, all of these, particularly in the green belt as well. So th there's many, many factors, but it is a very detailed and specialist area that not something that I'm familiar with, to be fair. Thank you very much. And when people talk about designs, and especially when t people talk about grand designs, sure. so they talk about the visualization and 3D visualization. Uh, how you see this technology in your profession? See, we, we are going through a digital age at the moment. Everything is so computerized. Um, and also clients' demands are increasing more and more so every day. They are becoming more and more aware. So to help them, not everybody can see things in three dimensions. So the architect's job is now becoming more and more under pressure to ensure we can interpret their vision in three dimensions through the use of complex CAD software, modeling software, to help the client understand what is going to be the end product that they're actually buying. So for sake of argument, if I want to request a design, so you can show me on your PC or on your laptop that the final look will be like this. So you can show me uh, inside, and so so it, this Absolutely. is Absolutely, yes. We, we 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 have the capability to be able to produce internal vision uh, visuals um, with external visuals as well of the property, um, and and this also helps uh, planning uh, officers as well to understand a certain concept because, as I said. Uh, not everybody can v uh, view things in three dimensions, uh, and it is a very, very beneficial tool. Thank you very much. How you see the changes, the present changes, and and the property market, especially? Uh, do you suggest that there should be more relaxation on the building regulation and the planning permissions, so people can have benefit of it? I think uh, I mean I think the laws are reasonably flexible at the moment as they are to be fair and as particularly with the permitted developments has been introduced and a lot of commercial clients and investors um, are benefiting from the change of use laws that have been introduced uh, and this is conversion uh, of pub, pub buildings to um, to uh, children's nurseries for example um, <clears throat> there's various uh, benefits that people are utilizing um, so I don't think uh, in my opinion, uh, that uh, the laws are stringent to, uh, to restrict people to develop a particular site, uh, unless there are valid reasons for those, and naturally we could help with that. Thank you very much. Now we'll touch upon uh, some commercial uh, side of it, because sure. we talked about residential side. So how easy is to change of use from one particular use to, let's say for sake of argument, from uh, shop to a hot food takeaway. Is it a sure. complicated application or, and you have to make both building regulation and planning permission together or you can do separately? No, absolutely. It, it, you, you, it's, not, uh, so, uh, it's not advised to run a planning and building regulations application in parallel purely because for argument's sake, if the planning, local authority have an issue with the planning approval uh, and they've got certain objections regarding the situation that we are we have put forward, then the building regulations process is likely to change. Um, so it's always advised to go through stage by stage process, um, make sure we've covered all ground to tick all the boxes and make sure the planning officers are happy before we move forward, yes. Uh, but for change of use um, to takeaways, I mean, be, there are certain things that um, the, the planners like to look at. This is uh, particularly for the environmental health officers, they're interested in the fume extraction, what type of uh, um, system you're installing and make sure the DB levels on the acoustics, noise, reverberation is not going to impact on the surrounding properties or particularly residents living above or um, towards the rear of the uh, businesses. And also parking, they will look at parking, disabled access um, um, and level thresholds into the building, particularly for commercial buildings and disabled access. How you see health and safety versus uh, building regulation and, of course, fire exit. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, th there are minimum travel distances and escape routes that you have to achieve <coughs> within buildings, and that will vary from building to building. So, obviously, schools and further education buildings have a different travel distance, and if you have more than one or two, then obviously that travel distance then is reduced. And so, building regulations has been calculated and it has been thought through 
of different categories of buildings to ensure that in the case of a fire, the occupants of the building are able to leave, uh, hopefully without any um, uh, injuries or, or deaths. Thank you. Now we are coming to the lighter questions. Uh, your favorite place? My favorite place, Morocco. I'm a huge fan of Morocco. Uh, I've visited numerous times as well and uh, strongly recommend it. And what's about the architecture there and the buildings? Absolutely, yes. There's, there's numerous buildings there that we've always visited, beautiful mosques there as well to see. Uh, but what I, what I particularly enjoy about it is the cultural aspect of it and the souks uh, and the traditional the tradition that you actually see there. It's authentic, um, it's not something that you will see anywhere else in the world. Thank you. And your favorite food? My favorite food, I'm a particular fan of Turkish grilled food. I think that's something um, I'd like to uh, uh, dabble in once in a while. And any particular dish? Any particular, no, Turkish grilled food generally, grilled meats, you mm. know, generally I think it's, it's super. One, it's healthy, uh, and uh, the taste of the barbecue is just fantastic. And your favorite sport? Um, I'm a big cricket and snooker fan. Um, uh, I'll tell you a bit more about the snooker, but uh, on, the, on the cricket side, I've, I've played for the Sheffield Collegiate Cricket Club. Um, I was captain of school for a couple of years as well, um, so I've had uh, I've had some good fun with the cricket and on the snooker side. <laughs> so you were an all rounder or a batter? Absolutely, or... yes. I, I used to uh, open the bowling uh, for my school cricket team, but as I became became a more mature uh, cricket player, I slowly went down the order. But I started to, uh, I started sorry I started to go up the order on the batting, but went down on the bowling side. <laughs> Any game you, which you will say this was my classic game uh, at any particular match? Yes, yeah, so there was a couple of scenarios where we went on a, a cricket tour to Northumberland um, and we had three three matches to play in three days uh, and, and the Saturday match there was a, one particular catch I was very impressed with uh, that uh, one of my colleagues, uh, it, it was a, a dive towards the right but I won't act it out now for you but uh, it was very impressive and memorable. <laughs> well done. And... Uh, when we have <clears throat> life and CV, you look at your whole life, the best moment of your life? The best moment, there are, I mean, there are many situations where you have memorable moments, but um, there was one in particular that I was thinking when uh, I actually set up my own business, and this was something that I always had intention to do. Um, but I think, Prior to that, what was more important was actually going in to set up my own business at the peak of a recession. Uh, and I felt that was a, a very, very important time for me um, in terms of achievement particularly. Um, because through, um, with my ex-colleagues um, that used to work with me, they, were, they thought I was crazy to, <laughs> to go and set up and work for myself uh, under the current climate. Um, but touch wood, it's, it's all gone well. Uh, since then, it's, uh, it's, it's just got stronger and stronger every year. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ahmed, to joining us in our show. And uh, we wish you good luck with your business. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.